Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a $1 billion plan to improve patient care at Maricopa County Hospital and Healthcare System. And we'll look at how the final four led to the makeover of an iconic Phoenix Park. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The Arizona Republic reports that an independent investigation that cleared State Parks Board Director Sue Black of wrongdoing was conducted by a law firm that's involved with advising the state on how to handle the claims made against Black. The Republic reports that the law firm, led by former State Representative Justin Pierce, conducted interviews without disclosing its relationship with the state. Black is accused of berating employees and getting drunk at public events. The investigation in question found no significant wrongdoings. And in a report released today, the new Maricopa County recorder, Adrian Fontes, blames his predecessor, Helen Purcell, for the decision to cut the number of polling places for last year's presidential primary. Fontes says that the decision came from the top down. He also cites overworked staff and bad communication for some of the problems that led to long lines and lots of unhappy voters, which in turn led to Fontes defeating Purcell in the November election. The Board of Maricopa County's Regional Health Care Safety Net System recently moved to go ahead with a $1 billion remake of the medical center and other health care facilities. Here to explain what all this means, especially in wake of possible changes to the Affordable Care Act, is Steve Purvis, President and CEO of the Maricopa Integrated Health System, and Susan Gerard, Chairman of the Maricopa County Health Care District Board. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining Thank us. You. Thank you. Good Before to be we get too far into this, I think a lot of people are confused by, by the Maricopa County Health System, the medical center, the whole nine yards. Give us, give us an, an explanation here. Sure, I'd be delighted to. Uh, Maricopa Integrated Health System has been uh, serving this community uh, and the state, frankly, for over 140 years. Actually, we were here before uh, Arizona was a state, back when we were a territory. And we've always been a public health care system, which really means that we have a mission uh, to serve uh, everybody without regard to their ability to pay and to be that safety net system of care uh, for people especially who fall through the cracks that don't have access uh, to health care. So how does, how does the medical center, the Maricopa County Medical Center, how does that differ from other hospitals in the area? Well I think the important thing is, is we're not just a medical center. We've got clinics all over the county, we have a mental hospital, we have an HIV clinic, uh, we have a refugee women's clinic. I mean, we do a lot of things. The, the, the hospital itself is a small part of, of, you know, or it's a significant role, but it's, it's just in the mix of all the things we do. So this is a nonprofit hospital? Oh, it's, and it's public. And it's public. And we're, we're a um, separate political subdivision. We're not part of the county. That's the other thing people always right, say. Right, right. So, so this, it, it's basically for everyone. It is for everyone. Uh, we're owned by the public. Uh, we're accountable to the public for the operation of our health system. And, and uh, yes, we are much more than a hospital, although teaching uh, and graduate medical education is, is a big part of what we do, but we're much more than that. All right. Uh, $1 billion remake of the health care system here, the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, How did all this get started? Where, where does it come from? Well, fortunately, um, our board uh, went through a very uh, exhaustive process, frankly, of bringing together citizens from the community, uh, a bond advisory uh, committee that made a recommendation that, yes, it was time uh, to go to the voters uh, and uh, ask for uh, support to uh, replace our aging teaching hospital and all of our clinics uh, and our behavioral health hospital. Uh, to improve capacity for behavioral health, uh, for example. So the voters passed that bond referendum in November of 14 uh, on Election Day, uh, which really set this into the motion, motion, giving us the resources to remake our health system. 2014 vote, uh, bond authorization approved, but still a little bit of time between now and then. W w shoring up finances involved, what, what happened between? Well, a lot has changed in the healthcare industry. Uh, since then even and then you know the Affordable Care Act was just coming on board at the time and having to see how what influence that had on our volumes and even the kind of people and the, what the community needs were uh, there's been change in methodology with the federal government about funding you know they're moving to value-based instead of fee-for-service so there's been a lot of changes and quite honestly we were having uh, 
financial issues that no one on the board felt it was appropriate for us to be spending any money until we made uh, Steve and his staff did an unbelievable job turning us around financially. How did you do that? Through a lot of hard work, <laughs> uh, but the no single thing did it. I mean, we, we lost a major uh, uh, funding source in the safety net care pool that provided about $50 million of supplemental funding for us to help us with the uncompensated care that mm -hmm. we were providing. So um, we began to look at our revenue cycle operations, the efficiency of our operations, um, how people work together, look, looking at our expense, uh, looking at new ways of doing things. And it really took everybody sort of you know, rolling up their sleeves to get this done. And so uh, we've made since uh, fiscal 14 uh, over a $60 million financial turnaround due to those kinds of things like that. And thus the board says, now we're ready to go with this $1 billion yes. expansion. Yes, exactly. Expansion includes uh, a new medical center, a new hospital. It will still be at 26th Street in Roosevelt? Uh, yes, yeah, so that was part of the, in the ballot initiative, is that we would stay in that location. Okay, the building has obviously been there a while. Do we need a brand new building there? Uh, we need a brand new building to do what we do. Uh, you know, some people might say that geographically there's a concentration in, in this area, but, you know, that's, that's just a reality. You know, pe pe you're going to build these uh, facilities where you've got the most people. Uh, but again, is, is, was a new building required? Was the old one just oh. not up yes, to stuff? Yes, I will tell you that building was planned in the early 60s. Uh, it was finally uh, constructed in the late 60s and uh, opened in the early 70s. So uh, it's obsolete by any modern standards that you might apply to, to our facility today. I found it interesting, though, that the, the plan calls for fewer beds than the older building. Is that true? And if so, Correct. why? And because that's the way that healthcare is heading. You know, our healthcare system is radically different than it was 20, 30 years ago. We're focused on keeping people out of the hospital today, and as a result of that, utilization rates, you know, in the into the hospital are lower than than what they were. We continue to make great strides keeping people well, rather than taking care of simply taking care of them after they become sick. If the goal is to keep people out of the hospitals, these outpatient health clinics better be up to snuff. That's part of this improvement plan as well? Yes, and doing the integration with behavioral health as well. That's another thing that we're seeing as a trend is that you have to treat the whole person. So how many health clinics are there out there? What kind of improvement will they see from this $1 billion improvement? Uh, well, ev every one of them, well, no, we have two that are new. Um, and uh, the rest of them all really need to even be changed their location because where they were built it, or buildings that existed, they're not on light mm -hmm. rail, they're not on bus lines, they're not convenient. So, but they'll still be in the same geographic area where they are. And we're also hoping to cover other areas of the county where we're not right now that have large concentrations of the kind of people we serve. It sounds as though uh, build a behavioral health hospital. Is that part of the plan? Is there a hospital to that end now? Yes, um, we have a freestanding behavioral hospital in Mesa called Desert Vista. Okay. We also have a behavioral health annex that's on our campus on Roosevelt. Uh, they're the only uh, inpatient facilities for the severely mentally ill population. And as we know, behavioral health is a major issue in our, in our society today. So we do not have enough capacity to treat that segment of our population. So our plan calls for not only uh, consolidating uh, and making those behavioral health facilities more convenient, accessible, and working better, especially with our physical uh, health care that we're providing, but also to increase the capacity uh, so that we can better serve our community. What becomes of Desert Vista in Mesa? Goes away? Stays? Improves? Um, do we know? I think we do own the land. You know, we've been sorting through different things with the county over the years. But, yeah, I mean, we'll probably sell it. I don't think we'd keep any operation out there. So, but so that's the kind of detail that we're involved with right now in our planning process. Uh, it's yet to be determined exactly, you know, what will happen to the Desert Vista facility. Um, we have a, very much a challenge in making sure that we continue to increase our capacity while we're planning the new process because we don't want to curtail capacity in the meantime. You, you, I, you know as well as probably anyone, uh, certain folks, certain segment of patients don't like change. 
mm -hmm. don't like being moved, and their families would like to know where they are and keep them where they are Absolutely. for the sake of consistency. So that's that has to be a factor, I would imagine. Sure, but but our behavioral health is more of a shorter term. At the state mental hospitals, where people might be for for years, right. we do all the court ordered evaluations to okay. stabilize people. Ours is not a long term care type facility. Okay. Um, the medical center, the new medical center timetable, when, when does it uh, arise? We started, we kicked off the planning this month. Um, the, uh, we'll, we'll be planning uh, and constructing our facilities over a six and a half to seven year period of time. The hospital is the most complex part of that, so that will take a longer time to come to fruition. We're looking at end of 21, beginning of 22, to actually occupy a new hospital. Uh, our ambulatory clinics you will see will um, start um, uh, being um, constructed a lot earlier than that time frame. All sounds very complicated. All sounds like a plan is in place. All systems go. What happens if the Affordable Care Act is repealed? What happens if Medicaid in Arizona takes a, a big shift? Uh, you know, I, I really find it hard to believe that would happen because it's not just us here in Arizona. I mean, it's every hospital in the state, it's every health care provider in our state, and everyone across the country. But if they actually did move to make a serious cut in Medicaid, uh, we would have to be reevaluating what we do. Really, the entire plan would have to be looked at again? I, uh, yeah, probably so, yes. You agree with that? I agree. Uh, we have a very specific financial plan going forward. Um, we have weathered uh, gr great uh, change uh, in terms of our financial uh, status. Uh, we've made great improvements. Uh, the ACA, if it's repealed with nothing reasonable to replace it, will make a significant impact on our financial operations as well as the state and every other hospital in the state of Arizona. Uh, would it mean no new medical center? Well, I'm not sure about that, but I do know that we won't be able to do everything that we have envisioned to reinvent our health care system for the benefit of the community if that comes to fruition. Nothing like moving goalposts out there, is right, it? Right, yeah. right. All right, good to have you both here. Thank you Thank so much you. for joining Thank you, good to be here. And up next on Arizona Horizon, the Final Four means more than basketball to Phoenix. We'll look at a park that's getting a makeover thanks to the big event. When I was... 12 years old, I was watching great performances on PBS. This program with Nuriev came on. Nuriev um, in a performance of Le Corsair, and I was amazed and awestruck. I really wanted to, to do it. I was street dancing at the time, and I never thought of formal dance until I saw great performances. I knew that I was really uh, a novice to dance, like high dance. I decided to check out the high school performing arts. And so one thing led to the next. Today, as a recognized dancer, I absolutely believe that when I saw the uh, performance, it affected me tremendously. And I know that's what happens when I teach. I'm opening an option for them that they hadn't seen before. The NCAA Final Four tournament is making its mark across the valley. Downtown Phoenix is getting ready for the Fan Fest and big concert series this weekend. University of Phoenix Stadium has been transformed and the tourists are already arriving. There's also a Phoenix Park that's received a $300,000 facelift thanks to the NCAA. Producer and videographer Zach Paukleb found out what makes Harmon Park 
so special. In some communities, the basketball court is the town square. For Steve Coulter, Harmon Park in Harmon Court, just south of downtown Phoenix, is more than a place to play basketball. It's a second home. My dad brought us here in, a ba in bassinets. So I literally crawled on this court at three months old, they told me. Coulter grew up in Phoenix. He and his father, Andrew, known by many as Mr. C, were staples at Harmon Park pickup games on Fifth Avenue. And those pickup games were some of the best in Phoenix. This was easily the spot, but you had to be aware that it was kind of rough and tumble. Uh, you were gonna get knocked down, you were gonna get slid into the walls, you were gonna get beat up, you probably left bloody and bruised, but you were actually better when you left here than when you came. Coulter said the physical play at Harmon Park prepared him for his eight seasons in the NBA. These days, Coulter, a recreation coordinator for the Phoenix Park and Recreation Department, oversees the park and its various free recreational programs. For kids in the community, Harmon Park is their favorite place to go to socialize and play some basketball. I got friends over there that do not come to this school. I play with them. I play with older kids that teach me how to play basketball and I just hang out with my friends. They really give our kids a safe place to learn and continue to grow. Uh, at school we focus a lot on academics. We do have after school programs here, after school sporting events. But sometimes the, the kids like, you know, just to go to a more relaxed area with a different scene. Tyson Kelly is the principal at nearby Lowell Elementary School and said having a place like Harmon Park is crucial to kids' development both athletically and academically. Mr. Coulter knows almost every kid by name. He, uh, you know, is able to communicate with them about academics as well as, you know, what's going on at the park. So it's been a great relationship. Both he and Coulter believe places like Harmon Park, which serves more than 18,000 kids annually, are critical to the communities they serve. The value of just this park and this community being here is that you will run into people that will surprise you every day with what they know and how they can help and then how they're willing to help. It's much more than the gym. The gym is the cornerstone of uh, really the activity in the area, but our kids also, the outside court, the fields, and the library are very uh, popular with our kids and very needed for the community. With Arizona hosting the 2017 Final Four, the NCAA selected Harmon Park for its legacy restoration project. And on March 28th, the renovations were unveiled to the public. Reopened and featuring several facility upgrades, including a new outdoor court and weight room, Harmon Park can continue to provide the surrounding community with a safe place to go and a place where kids like Devorah can be active. You get more at like athletic, like just playing outside, you could get better than just staying inside and just playing video games. Let's go! Let's go, Tigers! And for Coulter, he'll continue to use Harmon Park as a tool to impact as many young lives as he can. I'm grateful for all of the guys that have come through these doors. I have five to 6,000 brothers and sisters that are not biological, but it's because they've come through these doors and they've imparted some wisdom into my life uh, hopefully I've done the same, but they really came to sit and talk to my dad. Uh, that's, that's what's most important. Coulter emphasized that he is always ready to give a basketball lesson or two to kids at the same court he gained so much from when he was their age. The Harmon Park renovation started over a year ago. It's just one of many events connected to the NCAA Final Four. Here to talk about what it takes to put on a Final Four is Don Rogers, Executive Director and CEO of the Phoenix Local Organizing Committee. Welcome back to Arizona Horizon. Good to see you again. Thank you. It's great to be here. Last time we talked to you, this was all in the future, uh, just a dim kind of, it's here. It's here. And we actually did the dedication at Harmon Park and our, unveiled the logo there. It was about 507 days ago, and it was, wow. you know, we we felt pretty, you know, easy going then, and it's, <laughs> yeah. it's changed a little bit. It has. Uh, you are the executive director of the final. What does an executive director do? A little bit of everything. You know, I think the best way to describe what we do as a local organizing committee is 
you know, we're kind of the party planners for the NCAA. So I was fortunate to be involved in the bid, and it's been really uh, fulfilling to watch our vision um, put into action. But you're providing the venues. You mentioned March Madness Music Festival and Fan Fest. So you're working through with the cities, and you're providing transportation, and you're putting together the hotel block. And then you're getting to do really meaningful programs like the, the renovation at Harmon Park or the Read to the Final Four that we did with Helios that was a, a reading campaign for every third grader across the state of Arizona. We had over six million minutes read wow. since January 4th by a group of about 35,000 third graders. That sounds tremendous. So transportation, public safety, charitable events, you basically have to oversee all of this, don't you? We do. We, you know, we have a terrific team. There's about 15 of us all together that wear a lot of different hats. And so on one day you're talking transportation, then you're talking credentials, then you're talking Harmon Park, then you're, and, and that's what it really has made this um, fun is that you're, you get to do a lot of different things. As far as the game itself though, is that mostly an NCAA event? I mean, did they take care of that for the most part? They, they really do. There, there are things logistically that we provide. Obviously, the stadium is a huge piece of what we do, and that transforms into a basketball arena, which is really different. That's the first time we've done that at University of Phoenix Stadium. We also work with um, the local host institution, Arizona State, to provide all the game personnel, the hosts, the people that staff and meet the bands and take them to their areas. So there's a lot of pieces that we do in the building, but this is an NCAA championship and they do run it. They've come in every month since last June and they put all those pieces together. We spend probably the biggest part of our heavy lift is all of the other ancillary events that go on around the game. I would imagine that means a pretty good communication, pretty good relationship with cities. Absolutely, and I, I can't say enough about the city of Phoenix and the city of Glendale. We've had all of our cities involved because we have hotels in, in all of the cities. But the city of Phoenix, you know, this is really the epicenter, the hub downtown with the Fan Fest and the Music Fest. We have the National Association of Basketball Coaches are here. I walked into the lobby of the Sheraton and it's really honestly a who's who of basketball I'll coaches. Bet. I'll bet. And, um, and so the, the city of Phoenix has just been um, so generous, outstanding. I've talked to different people at the city of Phoenix today probably 10 times to help me with different issues. And so same with the city of Glendale, they're just really invested in making this successful. When you took over, what was the first order of business when you took the job? Really raising the budget to run this event. And so that that is the most, I'm gonna say that was really the most challenging. Um, people would ask, what if we didn't raise the money? And I would say that's not an, uh, an option. Mm -hmm. We actually finished our fundraising um, at the end of 2016, which really took a great, you know, kind of let us relax a little bit and then make sure that we stuck to our budget to implement all the things that we did for our donors and the companies and individuals that helped us out. But then it was putting together a team, you know, finding the right group of people that could come together and brought all these different sets of expertise. Um, which we did, and then it's just, a, it, it is really truly a year long um, of planning, of meetings, of talking about everything from what lanes you're gonna close so that the bus can pull up and pick up the fans, mm. the permitting, um, having the concert at Hans Park is, that's the largest concert series that will ever be held or has ever been held in Hans Park. And so you're working with ADOT, you're working um, you know, with the city, there's a lot of different folks that you have to yeah. work through a lot of different um, logistical issues. And I've learned a lot more about permitting than I ever wanted to or cared to. <laughs> but, I, I, you know, again, I go back to it really takes, the, you know, a team of individuals across the valley that there's at least 100 people that worked on this um, on a daily basis. 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 Yes. yes. So, so basically now, are we talking fine tuning? I mean, it, it, we're, we're just days away here. I mean, right. actually we're, we're in the midst of it in, in some respects. Yes. Fine tuning, troubleshooting, that's pretty much the... Absolutely. So, you know, we forget sometimes the NCA staff runs the whole March Madness. So they've been on the road. They all came in Sunday and Monday from the regionals, watching the regional champions uh, crown. And so they came in on Monday and then we're really 24 seven. 
and and dealing with dif different fires as you know we're kind of all firefighters this week yeah and um, and again just the ability to pick up the phone and have different folks that can help us out has has been essential that's really the network you're developing as I've learned as the, doing this for the first time I just had the director of the Houston uh, final four come in our office and I said you know hey you didn't you didn't tell me what this week was like <laughs> <laughs> this week is a little bit crazy so um, having that network of people has been really important so real quickly you left a career in college athletics a, a athletic director at Xavier back yes. when you had a guy named Sean Miller I yeah. think was head coach yeah, there. yeah we had a really talented you coach. were working in Arizona State University high up in the yes. athletic department you left all that for this is the job what you expected? It's been more than I expected it. You know, it was really a great opportunity for me to see the vision through of what we had put together, to work with some really exceptional people at the NCAA. Um, and, and what I didn't realize was the people that I was gonna meet along the way from the cities and um, our great tourism industry, and that has really been fun. And, and projects like Harmon, honestly, you know, using the platform sure. of the Final Four, to get to to um, impact a community like that was was just very fulfilling. Well, congratulations on all the great work. I'll say for the big congratulations for Tuesday. Thank you. Uh, but it sounds like everything's a go, and uh, good luck. Good to have you here. Thank you. And we'll see how it goes. Absolutely. Thank you. Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's a special Final Four edition of the Journalists' Roundtable. We'll look at the big impact, the game's impact on local businesses and what hosting a Final Four does for the Valley's sports reputation. A special sports reporter's edition on the next Journalists' Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.